And we are live with Dr. Kent Pakal, um, ringing us from, I believe, St. Paul, Minnesota. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Um, Dr. Pakal is the CEO of the Search Institute in Minnesota. They do wor work uh, wide and far around um, building relationships with children that empower them and help them thrive in life. Um, I love their work and have for a long time because they give us a more positive frame for understanding childhood and children that replaces the deficit frame that too many of us have for our youth and for our young people in our communities. And it's, uh, it's an amazing thing to have. Kent has also um, been a classroom teacher and worked in uh, the central office in St. Paul Public Schools, so has seen the way that we work with children from many different vantage points. Um, Kent, thank you for coming on this morning. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, this is a, it's, an, it's an honor. I've been a, a, a fan of the series, and it's, uh, it's cool to be a part of it. Yeah, well, I've always loved the work that you do and think that it's critical to the, um, the discussion that we have in and out of education. Uh, having seen the way that we work with children in social services and having, having also been an education activist on the education side, I just feel like the conversation and debate goes wrong a lot of the times. And, and we don't, we, it's probably time for a positive reset. So the work that you do with developmental assets, I think is very deep and robust and also um, hard for me as a, a lay person, as a civilian <laughs> to make super simple. Um, and, but I, th I, I think it has to be understood by people because I think it's just that important. But I want to just back all the way up and go to um, uh, a talk that you had uh, that I watched. And you talked about a study that was done with middle schoolers, I believe seventh graders. And they were given two different kinds of feedback on papers that they had had wrote. And, um, and the two different types of feedback um, had a widely different response from the kids in how much they tried. Uh, can you talk about that study just a little bit? Yeah, it actually is kind of an interesting lead into the work we're trying to do on developmental relationships because the researchers who did that study, and in my talk, I actually combined three studies into one in a little talk. And the, the there were several researchers who were a part of it, but David Yeager, who's at the University of Texas at Austin, was kind of a, a through line in all of those. They didn't think of their study as being about relationships. They thought of their study as being about wise feedback a way of talking to kids. Um, what I've said to, to, to David and others is in my mind, it is a powerful example of what happens in a developmental relationship. Um, so I talk about that study, but the researchers weren't really thinking about it as relationship. They were thinking about it as manipulating the feedback you give. So what happened was um, it was in one school, a uh, middle school, about half African-American, half white kids in the school. And it's been a study that's only been done one time in one school. So we have to put a big caveat by that. Um, given you that, that it's, it's being replicated right now. Is, is that is right? Being, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, you know, like everything in research, we can't get too excited about one finding, but the findings were pretty exciting. And essentially, to make a long story short, what they did was they had kids in seventh grade um, uh, practicing writing and they were told nobody's born a good writer and even the best novelists in the world have got editors and so you only become a good writer through practice and so now we're going to practice writing and they were assigned an essay about a personal hero and it's probably pretty important that it was a personal hero because in theory at least it was something they were interested in and they wanted to write upon mm -hmm. but they were told while you're writing about your personal hero we're going to work on writing so they the teachers who were the regular seventh grade teachers of those kids assigned the essay and the kids wrote their essays on their personal heroes and then the researchers manipulated two messages back to the kids. Now, the kids never met the researchers. They, uh, they had the teachers write one of two messages in their personal handwriting on a basically like in a large post-it note. And then they gave the kids back their essays with comments and feedback um, on the essays, which the researchers did not have anything to do with. It was how the teachers wanted to grade the essays. And they gave the um, kids back their essays covered in a um, folder individually so the kids wouldn't all realize that there were planned messages here. And one message was, um, uh, I'm giving you these comments so you have feedback on your essay. Neutral message. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the other was, I'm giving you these comments because I have very high expectations and I believe you can meet them. And mm -hmm. I didn't quite get that. But it was the... 
the gist. And so the first message really wasn't, it wasn't negative. It wasn't like, I'm really disappointed again in your, like, but it was neutral, it was transactional. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The second message was high expectations and belief. And there's a huge research literature around everything from the power of warm demanders as teachers of, of African-American kids and to some extent students of color. Um, and, and so then they followed what happened with those two messages. And the first t- uh, measure of impact was which kids chose to revise the essay one week later, correcting the mistakes and improving mm-hmm. on it. Mm-hmm. And, and in this school, about half the kids are white, half the kids are black. I should say they also looked at gender and socioeconomic status and didn't find an effect in, in mm-hmm. that. In, study it really was about race and culture um and so so, for so let's white, just stick with that for a second it didn't have effect whether you're a boy or a girl not in this one study not in this, in this one study effect. okay and it didn't matter where you fit on the economic status ladder yeah we're talking about yeah. very small number of kids here but okay. they tried to control for instance for did the african-american kids receive free or reduced price lunch or not mm-hmm. and they didn't mm-hmm. find ses seemed to influence it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so um without I don't want to quote the numbers and get it entirely off, but um, for the white kids, about low 60% revised the essay with just the neutral message, and it got to about 80% with Mm -hmm. the expectations message. So most of them did it, and somewhat more did it. But the increase for the African-American seventh graders was just dramatic. If I'm remembering right, it went from 27% um, or thereabouts who revised it with the neutral message Mm -hmm. to over 70% who revised it with the high expectations. Mess, a dramatic increase. So that was the first study, and it showed this increase in a very important learning behavior, uh, practicing to improve to write in one week. But you know, we know from a lot of exper- experiments, unfortunately, you can get an effect briefly and then it fades. So mm-hmm. what they did in the Holland study is they looked one year later. Wait at a this second now. So we should actually just put a, a peg in this one though. Okay. So you have kids in a classroom, you give them two kinds of feedback. Yeah. One kind of feedback is lukewarm and just says, Hey, this is feedback. Neutral. Right? You go, yeah. Neutral. You know, I've written on your paper. Look at me. I've written on your paper. The other feedback that you give them is the reason that I have written on your paper is because I have high expectations for you and I know you can meet it, which is a, a aspirational message that um, has a call and response because it calls you to your higher angels, right? And when you do that, you have somewhat of an effect for white kids. You have no effect for girls really necessarily. It's not no effect for girls, but the fact that they're girls doesn't give you an effect. And the fact that you may be poor, rich or whatever doesn't give you the effect. But with black students in this one study, I know you keep saying that because (laughs) researchers like to hedge their their thing. So in a minute, when we quickly talk about the the, the two effects, it's mind blowing that we have to be cautious um, because we've all silver bullet here. um. And then people just grab it and run with it. You know, so, so in this case though, you went from, you know, about 27%, 27%, I thought it was 17, but you know, 27% right. or something like that to a very high number. That's a big growth of the number of people that would actually try harder, of students that would try harder. Highly significant for that African-American group of kids. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And um, and then what they did that was really, um, is frankly how we should always do research and education, but we don't often enough do it because of money and complexities. They followed the kids over time. So they mm-hmm. followed them into eight, eighth grade the following year and they saw the first thing they looked at very very important variable that a lot of us are thinking about discipline rates who gets suspended who gets caught up in the discipline continuum Mm. Um, they found for the white kids who got the neutral message and high expectations message no impact on getting caught up in the disciplinary infraction but they found a significant decrease for the african-american kids who got that high expectations message one year later so you're communicating to kids po- a positive message about their abilities to, to meet high expectations. If you follow those same kids over time, the ones who got the neutral message have a different outcome in discipline rates than the ones that have that got the the positive feedback. Is that that's the finding in the in the second? Ones who got the, with, so. the ones who got the neutral message had got caught up. Of course, there was a. I shouldn't say of course because it's a painful reality, but it's the universal reality. African American kids got caught up in the disciplinary uh, swirl um, in this middle school more than white kids, and the African American kids who got the neutral message had got got suspended and had um, other disciplinary infractions at the same rates as African American kids usually did in the school. Mm-hmm. But African American mm-hmm. kids who got the high expectations message in seventh grade had a significant reduction one year later, and what's really 
really mind blowing is that the researchers didn't do any other intervention than that one message mm -hmm. in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And then um, what was really striking is they followed five and a half years later and looked at college enrollment and mm -hmm. found uh, a uh, no change for the white kids from neutral message and high expectations message and a significant increase in college enrollment for those African-American kids. And, mm. and when we do workshops um, with uh, educators and others, we usually, when I actually have the data, I didn't know we were going to talk about this, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful study, so I'm glad to. Um, we usually stop there and we say, how could that have happened? Why? How could, um, first of all, the first message have motivated the kids to do the work differently, to revise mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. We think about that. And then we kind of have everyone write a hypothesis on a piece of poster paper or something. And then we tell them about the improvements one year later in discipline rates and five and a half years later in college enrollment. And by that point, pe some people validly are questioning the data. Is this mm -hmm. a study? Mm -hmm. That seems impossible, which is important to, to talk about. And then um, we say, and how could that have happened? And often this is a can be a messy workshop to facilitate because you can get into hypotheses about the low expectations in black families and these these teachers must have really changed the kids whole world and you say well how do you know that in fact there's a lot of evidence to say that african american families have a very high value on education mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um long story short what it comes down to for us and the work we're doing at search institute is that when you build what we call a developmental relationship with a kid um, you can change the way that young person sees themselves, sees you, and sees the world, and the way they behave. And then this is the key point, and it often doesn't come up. Another key point: you also change the teacher's perception. The teachers mm -hmm. are seeing those kids differently. The kids mm -hmm. think would revise the essay and and not get in disciplinary trouble and want to go to college. And so the the mechanism in a relationship is two way. It's not just that that wise feedback message impacted the kid. The wise feedback message almost certainly impacted the way the teachers, because if, if it hadn't impacted the way the young person sees himself or herself and school and the way the system sees the kid, we wouldn't have gotten these gains a year mm -hmm. later. Because mm -hmm. researchers didn't mess with anything other than those two. Mm -hmm. A key point that I didn't uh, mention at, at the beginning, Chris, is that in this particular study, the teachers were white, and the as we said at the beginning, half the kids were white and half kids African American. So I was I was share that at the beginning when I talk about it because um, it's an important variable to be able to um, to be able to think about uh, in looking at that one study. It's interesting. Well, you know, that's interesting to me. Just in that, when we see the studies continuously come out that say that. Um, black teachers and white teachers have a different effect on black students and specifically black male students for sure. But um, people rarely go the next step and ask the question, why? Yeah. Like, like, give me an answer of why. Like, I know we have assumptions about why, but have you studied it? Tell me why it makes a difference. But this type of study illuminates just one little spot for me, which is it does matter, the messages that you send to kids and it is possible that people who are closer to you in your own culture will send you messages in a way where they're holding you to a, to account to something that they know you can hit versus someone who's been steeped in deficit thinking about what you can hit. So they, they come across differently with you. Um, you said this is one study. You keep saying this is one study. But does this fit in with the, the previous studies that go back a long way about the, what is it, the Pygmalion effect? Yeah, it does. The one thing I want to add, though, with the, you're right about the deficit thinking, Chris, but the other thing that is why I think that this emphasis on development relationships is so powerful is that, yes, there's deficit thinking out there, there's bias out there, we've got to counter it with everything we can. Another way to read this study, though, is that for the, in this particular study, the African-American kids, neutral wasn't enough. That mm -hmm. a new, it wasn't, the first statement wasn't biased, you know, objectively. The researchers never would have gotten the study approved if it was like, uh, you know, this shows me people like you don't succeed. It was neutral. But yeah. a neutral statement was insufficient to engage those young people in the putting themselves on the line in the additional effort. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, to the bias point, but I think what we're saying too is, no, actually there's a forward leaning relational connection that is necessary. Mm -hmm. And I bet there's a lot of teachers, I bet I was like this sometimes as a classroom teacher, where you, you, you write what you think is a professional instructional message, but mm -hmm. it's void of belief, connection, 
knowing the kid, valuing the kid, and for the students for whom there there is um, there are lots of factors challenging their connection to school. That neutral, um, uh, uh, maybe unbiased, but very transactional connection it is not um, sufficiently engaging and motivating. So mm-hmm. there's so much in this study we can unpack. And yes, the answer is it when you when you think back on the large bodies of research on the Pygmalion effect, this uh, new work builds on that. What it does though, the classic Pygmalion studies were pretty much all with white kids. Mm-hmm. And this brings in the large factor of race, culture, bias um, into that same construct, which is that the beliefs we convey to kids and the way, the thing that's important about the Pygmalion studies is it, it was about belief, but the belief translated into very tangible actions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Teachers were told that these kids in the, for those of your viewers who don't know the study, they manipulated a message and told kids that there was a fake test that actually the Harvard test of inflected intelligence that kids had been given and that they could predict which kids were going to grow faster, even though they seemed slower at first, they were going to peak later. Mm-hmm. And not only did it impact the teachers, you could never get that study approved today, by the way. They just lied. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it didn't just change sort of perception, the perception changed action. So what they found, for instance, is those teachers asked more challenging questions of the kids who were struggling, but who were, they were told were going to be late bloomers. Mm-hmm did longer wait time when they would ask a question, knowing the teacher, oh, you're not going to get the answer. If this is uncomfortable, I'm going to move on to the next. They would, they would hold the you know wait time for the kid because they said, oh, this kid, he's struggling now, but or she's struggling now, but they're a late bloomer. Like they're going to, they're going to come. And so they, 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 they hanged in there with that connection in the classic Pygmalion studies. And what work that you are asking about around wise feedback starts to do is um, is kind of bring that forward into the diversity of um, student needs that we're seeing in our schools today. Well, very simply for me, so I talk about the belief gap a lot because I actually believe that the power of beliefs are, are really important. Um, and, and I think someone listening to this might be offended by the idea that they're not doing enough right now or they might be, they might get the wrong message about what they're doing in the classroom right now. They might listen to something like this and say, one of many things, you're calling me a racist or you're saying that I don't expect enough of these students or you're saying, so so they will hear this in a negative way. And I I wonder what you would say to them to help somebody get over the hump of, this isn't being critical of what you do right now. This is telling you generally, empirically, um, it, it matters, the messages that we send and you may or may not have been trained to do this. Um, so that's, it's a great lead into the work we're trying to do at Search Institute. Um, our stuff, which I can, which I'll talk about in a second, if if it, whenever, whenever it works for you. But it's all on how you build what we call a developmental relationship with a kid, and so mm-hmm. I, I love that. Um, but to your point about people feeling um, almost shamed by the message, it's actually a really powerful point, and it's one that it took us a while to realize. I remember I was doing a workshop with teachers, and we have full-time trainers who are much better than I am at this stuff, but I kind of like to work directly with schools. And we also do a lot with out-of-school time and foster care and starting with juvenile justice, sectors that touch kids. Mm-hmm. I like to do it when we're building out new content. So I was in the middle of this workshop with a, a high school, urban high school, and it was all on development relationships. And so I introduced our stuff, as we can talk about in a minute. And at the break, two teachers came up to me and um, one of them was crying, and then the other kind of started crying. And I thought it was going great. <laughs> wow! Yeah, I feel like you're saying we don't care about mm-hmm. kids, mm-hmm. and I mean to me, this was on like the the positive, touchy feely part of the workshop because we like to start with going back to the relationships that mattered in your life. Luckily, first of all, there were two of their colleagues there to talk to me as well who had a very different reaction. They said, "Oh, we don't." But long story short, what we've learned to to begin the work with um, educators in particular is saying. Almost all of us got into this profession because we believe in the power of relationships. We were probably personally formed by the power of relationships. It's why, if you, if you don't, you probably shouldn't be in the profession. Mm-hmm. But there are so many things that mitigate against putting relationships first. And to the extent that we value them at all, there's something that we just expect to happen organically. Mm-hmm. We don't plan for them. We don't do professional development on them. We don't have data on them. We don't evaluate really people on them. In We um, we talk about them rhetorically, but often they're nowhere in the mission, vision, value statements in schools. They're like this sort of thing we expect to happen. 
Mm-hmm. We're not uh, for an absence, for instance, of an emphasis on development relationships. We're saying we now know a ton from the research about the fact that relationships um, um, need to be a practice. And that mm-hmm. actually in almost every school have people who are great at it. But we rarely actually try and talk about it. We really try and learn from it. And we also, mm-hmm. well, for instance, we have white teachers who are great at connecting with kids of color. And everybody knows it. And nobody actually tries to figure out why. Why are you able to do this? You know, and people can point to them. We do these snowball mm-hmm. things in schools where we ask the kids, which teachers push you but because you feel like they really care about them. And with striking frequency, they name the same teachers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's about trying to say, no, this isn't um, – this isn't blaming you or anybody for the, the past. It's saying that we need to make relationships another critical part of our practice. And that's the stuff that we're trying to do. With so our I would love to roll into the, the five development yeah. relationships or domains. But as we go into that, I will say about this point with teachers, what they hear, if they hear it as criticism, it, it, it makes it hard for them to receive the information. Um, in a way that will help them improve practice. You said it's a practice. These things around relationships are a practice. What I hear in that as not a teacher is that if you are white and your relationship in the regular world is not one where your relationship with people of color is intimate or knowledgeable or intact in a way that makes sense. And now I put you in a classroom. It's not as if you leave that part of your experience in the world behind and you suddenly became become culturally aware in the classroom, right? Your relationships get better. So I do think something has to happen between the time that you are being educated to be a teacher and the time that you stand before children, that there is some work around you understanding your own relationship that you already have and then the relationship as it will matter in the classroom. Uh, yeah. Um, so let's talk about the five development relationships. Well, let me just say to, to I'll, I'll do a quick overview of what they are, but let me just tell you the next wave of our research um, is how do you build culturally responsive developmental relationships? Mm-hmm. And so what we've done thus far is we've proven that the five elements that I'll quickly touch base on now correlate with all the stuff we're after. They correlate with improved academic outcomes. They correlate with improved social emotional skills. They correlate with reduced risk behaviors. Mm-hmm. Um, really, um, for, and that's true across kids. It's true across contexts. The next question, um, among one of the next questions, is how do we build those, uh, both taking advantage of the power and positive power of culture, and how do we build them across culture? So briefly, what it is, is there's five key elements, and if you go to Search Institute website, you can see under each of these are very specific actions that bring them to life. But the five key elements of a developmental relationship are expressing care, challenging growth, providing support, sharing power, and expanding possibilities. Very briefly, expressing care is showing kids that they matter to you. If they didn't come back tomorrow, they think you would miss them. Challenging growth is pushing kids out of their comfort zone, stretching them, um, kind of the zone of proximal development. For those of uh, you out there who've paid attention to that idea from educational psychology, you want to be one step ahead of what's easy, but not so far, it's not so far ahead, I can't do it. Providing support um, is neither leaving kids to figure it out on their own, which we see all the time in classrooms and in other settings, but it's also not being a helicopter parent or essentially disempowering the kid by doing it for them. It's like that guide on the side or, or helping kids complete goals and tasks. The fourth is sharing power, voice and choice that in an age-appropriate way, the kid has um, an opportunity to exercise agency. And then finally, expanding possibilities is um, exposing kids to new people, new places, new ideas um, through the flow of your relationships. Um, And when we see kids that experience high levels of those elements in their relationships with teachers, parents, and out-of-school time staff, those are the three sectors that we've studied uh, rigorously. As I said before, the outcomes are better, the risk behaviors are lower. The next step of our work is, okay, that's nice. How, kind of like you were saying um, earlier, how do you do it? How do you build it? And that's why we're building these tools that are designed to help teachers, youth program staff, and others, parenting adults, um, bring those five elements to life. And if you go to our website right now, we just put it up there tied to the coronavirus crisis. There's a self-assessment that you can take that will have you answer like 20 quick questions and it'll give you a score for in your own 
work with kids, whether you're a teacher or a parent, um, which of these five are you paying a lot of attention to and which are you paying a little attention to? And then what you can do is you can um, get click and get a set of approaches and activities that you can um, you can integrate into your work with kids. And we tried to make them pretty user friendly for for teachers and out of school time staff who are working virtually with kids right now. But there's also stuff there that is designed to be helpful with with parents. So it's called the relationships check. And if you, it's free and website, you can do it quickly and it'll give you a, a quick self assessment of where you are with these with these five elements. So here we go. It's on we have it on the screen here from your website, the developmental relationships framework. You had you said there are these five areas that are not all fitting on the screen at once. So let me scroll a little bit. Um, express care, challenge growth, provide support, share power, and expand possibilities. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. We did a, I did a webinar. So the national organization communities in schools, which is a great organization. They're in about 2,400. I know them. Yeah. Schools, They're great. Uh, taking our framework and our measures, because we build measures of this stuff to measure the relationships and how they connect to outcomes and our tools to scale across our network. And so I did a, a webinar yesterday with their national um, network of site coordinators. And we did a short poll. Um, to say which of these five in your work with students now, and, and all kids getting connected to CIS are facing significant challenges in their lives in some way. We said, which of these five are you paying attention to right now? And very interestingly, the um, two that, kind of predictably, the two that got almost all of the um, votes, the self-assessment, were expressing care and providing support. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This coronavirus, literally nobody, and this was hundreds of site coordinators for CIS uh, across the country. Um, nobody said they were working to expand possibilities or share power. And a minuscule number said they were going to challenge, they were challenging growth. So we had, you know, in Zoom in the chat box, kind of a discussion of that. And we said, is that what you think your kids developmentally need at this time during this really difficult time we're all living through? And long story short, at the end of the webinar, we asked all of them to pick one element that they are not focused on with students that they're going to try and integrate into it. And it was really amazing to see literally just constant, um, very tangible ideas that these um, people working with our kids were coming up with off the top of their heads to take the relationship that they're working really hard to build during this difficult time and add an element to it. Mm -hmm. Adding, yeah. Times are tough. I want to support you, but you know what? You still actually have to keep working toward your goals. Mm -hmm. You don't want to work on your goals. So the most of them were saying they were going to work on challenge growth, that they were going to add some growth to it. Mm -hmm. One of the things communities in school does is, is try and have kids set their own goals and work towards it. Um, and a lot of them had said, you know what? I've kind of slacked off on that because I want to empathize with them in this difficult time. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, I shouldn't drop it altogether. Because then I'm sending this message that, you know, you kind of don't have to keep pushing during this time. So it was interesting. You know, um, as I listen to this, there's going to be somebody who's listening to this right now who's going to be thinking to themselves. Number one, this seems like a lot, um, a lot to, to think about and to do. And especially if you're talking about um, improving the practice of teachers, everything that you try and work with teachers on requires nuance and deep thinking and whatnot. So this, you know, sounds like a lot. It's not just it's not just um, teachers though. It's calling into account either though. I want to say this is probably calling all adults around a child into account to understand these things. But someone's going to think this is gobbledygook, right? They're going to be they're going to think, oh, this is like a bunch of sel, warm and fuzzy, soft stuff. And in the world of education reform, we look for things that are hard, concrete, measurable. Um, we, you know, we, we've had this large no excuses discussion. It's all about discipline, how you use time, got to make everybody kind of walk in a row, can't waste any time between classes or whatnot. And here you come along with this thing about relationships being the thing that matters. And I wonder if you have any thoughts or ideas or if you even consider it fair that that seems to be coming from the more therapeutic side of the education debate and it could easily get overshadowed by what's the harder, I don't know if it's even fair to call it the harder science stuff or whatever, the, the, the harder discussion that we have in education. 
it's a cute, it's a constant danger of the work that we're doing because we don't, you know, the example that gets used a lot, which I think is actually not bad, although it's a, a little overstated is the self-esteem movement in the seventies that, you know, we're just, that we don't want to become that at all. We are always clear. We try to be that relationships are necessary, but not sufficient. And so the quality of the curriculum, the quality of the instruction, the equity of your school environment, all of that is essential. But if you don't also have as much a focus on relationships, you're missing what we and others have called the active ingredient in your, your recipe for kids, like fluoride and toothpaste. You're missing mm -hmm. the thing that brings it to life. And so it's a tension. We go in and we work with people and essentially they really, really do um, uh, sometimes gravitate way too far to the other end of the spectrum and that the relationship is the only thing. And I'll be honest, sometimes I have that even among our own research staff. We were um, uh, doing a debrief on a project and they were describing some observations they'd done with kids and they talked about how this teacher that they were very moved by just let students who were kind of struggling in any given moment just decide to get up and go in the hallway and go uh, get a drink to, to self-regulate. And they saw this as a highly relational, positive thing. And I said, well, okay, tell me about that, though. Like, what pattern is that kid learning? And is that going to apply to subsequent classes or into the workplace or post-secondary education? Mm -hmm. and, um, and there was no particular answer to that. And it was one, uh, this was early in our work, one example for me of how we can't let it become the relationship instead of the content. It's that the relationship needs to be co-equal. And frankly, Chris, if you go into like any really high performing private school, you know, that are, that are on the other end of the equity spectrum, mm -hmm. we need to convince them that relationships are central. It's foundational there. It's mm -hmm. what, you know, it's the way we do things here. And then we get to um, some of the schools where kids arguably need and deserve those relational connections the most. And it gets um, subsumed by other priorities. Um, mm -hmm. I think the point is to 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 elevate it and have it be. You know, I do want to say I think in everything that you're saying right now, you still run the risk, and this is just me as a civilian. So you know, not with all the science, of a teacher being offended. Yeah, like be, you know, really, really wilting underneath what you're saying right now, because even though it sounds super positive to me, to them it's almost like you're telling me that I don't care enough now or I don't believe enough now or whatnot. I love the fact that you guys have a way of which you can train. You can work with people and you probably have encountered that already. So you already know how to do it. But I do know when this discussion comes up outside of like a search institute conversation, you get a lot of hurt feelings with teachers who currently teach. And then you get a lot of anger on the other side because we're like, we don't have time for your hurt feelings. We need our kids to learn. Right. Like we're not sending our kids to you to have you have feelings up or down about them. It's we want them to come home readers and learners. Um, Raymond Ankrum, who is a school leader here, um, has a comment that says this is an amazing tool. And I think he's talking about the five relationships, uh, developmental relationships. This is an amazing tool for teachers and middle class parents, but it furthers the divide between the haves and the have nots. How does this help parents that have been historically disenfranchised. Um, I'm hoping what Raymond is talking about is the specific tool that we just made available for free on our website, which is that relationships check, um, as opposed to the, the framework of the five. Mm -hmm. We do a lot. Um, I agree with him completely. We put that on the web because at this moment, we're trying to just get out whatever we can. You know, we're a nonprofit and we had a funder that was able to get a little bit of money to take that. It's a tool we use in workshops and put it on the web. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with him that it is not going to be accessible to many of the parenting adults we most want to reach. We have a large strand of our work that works to reach those parenting adults through youth serving organizations or other agencies that connect with them. And that is very much person to person. Mm -hmm. so we have a, a, a parent, uh, a, it's essentially a program to have parenting adults um, strengthen the developmental relationships they build with their own kids. It's called Keep Connected, and it's really aimed at middle school, like as kids are moving into adolescence. And we've run it in um, low-income housing in D.C., in uh, rural schools, in a, a large community center in San Pedro, California, outside L.A., um, all of which are the communities that I think Raymond is talking about. We work with 
the agency and then they run it with their parenting adults. So they bring, mm-hmm. and the, it's pretty cool. The kids come in with the parents. Our problem with it is um, a good problem to have, which is that it's very impactful, but it's too intensive. It's too much of a heavy lift for some of the, the parents. And so we're trying to think, can we frankly get it shorter and less intensive? But I want to agree with him that like sticking a tool like I just uh, introduced on the web is not going to reach a lot of the parents that we are most eager to reach. Um, mm-hmm. Let that keep us from putting it up there. But we're also hoping, as he said, he said it'd be good for teachers and we are hoping teachers and also youth workers and others use it. Um, but it's not sufficient. And it's definitely well, not- And if Raymond, if you're listening, Raymond, which I know you are, because Raymond's my colleague from Eight Black Hands, I would say to the extent that the message that we send to students uh, has a di- makes a difference in how they respond and perform, I honestly would say the same is true for parents, right? If you send parents a cold or institutional message, um, it, it sets one, one thing, one type of relationship. If you set a really low bar for what being a parent means, and yeah. you send a very low bar message about parenting, which I am deeply interested in right now, it certain type of behavior. And if you set a very high expectation of parents too, I think that they rise to the challenge. On parents, you wrote something a while ago about um, something that comes up a lot when we're talking about uh, how parents are viewed when they don't show up for teacher conferences or you know when they don't participate or are involved in the way that we think they should be. You wrote a couple of years ago as a former classroom teacher who, despite my best efforts, experienced low levels of parent involvement I know it's tempting to interpret this tepid response as evidence that most parents are not deeply concerned about their child's or their children's education. But the work I am doing now at the nonprofit organization, the Search Institute, has led me to believe that a different, more important dynamic is at work. I would love to hear what you mean by that, because it's a perennial problem that we look at parents who don't show up for the teacher you know, conference at dinner time where you have to take three buses to get there on a weeknight um, as being low levels of of involvement and therefore you don't care. But you have you have a different attitude about that since you've been at search. Yeah, there's um it, it goes back really, Chris, to where you started. And it's actually the reason that I was interested in going to Search Institute. Long before I got there, this little nonprofit perched in Minneapolis was one of several places saying we have to stop the deficit thinking. We, you know, whenever you approach any, you can be tough, you can be angry, you can be um, pushing for deep change, but whenever your starting point is the, the failings of kids and families or of the educators in our schools, um, you're starting, you're, you're fighting with one hand behind your back or two, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so with parents, you know, from when I was a, you know, teacher to this journey, the first, of course, are the structural things that you're talking about, you know, holding the parent-teacher conferences at, from 530 to 730 and having it be basically like an arena scheduling thing where you sit there and you wait 30 minutes to talk to each teacher and you look around and you say, the parents who most need to be here have no possibility of being engaged in that. So there are mm-hmm. structural things. But the thing that um, is a little more tied to our work at Search Institute is to what extent are you as a, let's just stick with uh, teachers because it's such a big part of your work. To what extent are you trying to understand that student through the eyes of that parenting adult? Mm-hmm. Um, because your job is the student. You know, we, 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 we can sometimes spill over into these super wonderful, but frankly, very utopian visions of what individual educators and schools should be doing with parenting adults. And that's that would be great, but there's just huge resource constraints for how much you can do. But uh, meaning, you know, the whole notion of family school partnership and you're going to be like, you know, uh, harnessed at the hip with the parenting adults of your kids and doing all those things. All would be great, but it's just there's a practical challenge. But to what extent are you trying not just to sort of, you know, send materials home in the backpack, but to get to know the kids you're serving through the through the eyes of the parenting adult? Because mm-hmm. um, I cannot, even in my own kids who've gone to the urban schools of, of, of St. Paul, which produced me long ago and that I uh, supported in many ways and where I used to work, I think I can count on far less than one hand the number of times a teacher has ever asked me during a parent-teacher conference for my perception of my kids. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> that's so true <laughs> that's so true and, you know like and and it's kind of a thing and i work pretty hard to make people you know comfortable in a conversation or something maybe i'm self delusional about that but um i always leave thinking uh, i've been raising this kid for 17 years 16 years and um you probably could have gained some insight from asking me um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, asking the parent to divulge the kid's deepest, like, uh, challenge, although that certainly would be useful. But it could be just like, you know, at Search Institute, we use this idea of sparks. What do kids love to do? What do kids mm -hmm. actually find in and meaning in? And for a Fortnite. lot of kids, it's Fortnite. I got it. I got the answer to that. Fortnite. <laughs> Fortnite. <laughs> yeah. Ask that parent, what does your child love to do? Where are they most themselves? What are they... You're getting, first of all, you're getting valuable information from the, about your student, but you mm -hmm. are, you're building a different kind of relationship with that parent. You're like, I want your opinion. I want your um, ideas. And I, I imagine, Kent, that a lot of educators listening to this would say, yeah, you try and do that over, you know, a uh, hundred kids a day. You know, like if, if you're a teacher in a middle school and up or in an elementary grade level, you try and do that over 30 to 35 different kids, form a unique, special snowflake relationship with each. But I just want to put a fine point on what you're saying right now as a civilian and as a parent. You just mentioned that you weren't ever asked in all those years about your child and you're an educated person who's come through the system and understands the system. So you're far from a civilian and you're having that experience, right. which has to tell you that a person who's not um, all of those things, have all those advantages, is really probably experiencing something a little bit worse. But I have written about this in the past, and I'll never stop telling this story, um, of the teacher who in a hallway one morning, um, when I'm dropping my kid off and I'm feeling great about the fact that I'm walking my kid through the classroom or to the classroom and we're just, you know, whatever. It was a, a, a good morning for me and everything. And she says to me, you know, he didn't really go to, uh, to daycare, did he? And I'm like, I thought it was the strangest question. I was just like, um, no, he stayed at home with my wife, you know, blah, 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 whatever. She said, yeah, I can tell. I can always tell the ones that didn't, you know, um, he's really lethargic, a lot of really lethargic in the morning. That word lethargic, I'm standing in a hallway a grown ass black man with a white woman who I'm turning my kid over to my kid who I believe is funny as hell is um, buoyant and, and, and beautiful and awesome and, and sometimes loud, um, sensitive, gentle. I can just keep going with the positive right. attributes. The word, what do you think I remembered for the entire rest of the year? I, to this day, I remember the word lethargic coming out of her mouth because I wanted to snatch wigs in that school and pull my kid out that morning. You can have a lot of those experiences and the person on the other side would have no idea that you walked away with like a red hot sense of like, oh, hell no. Um, and I'm sure she didn't. And I'm sure she's not a bad person, right? Well, that's pretty bad, actually. You're being a little charitable there. I mean, to have that that's... I mean, to have said that with the point about the daycare, I mean, you're suggesting causation and fault and you're making a judgment. You're using character behavior language, what the psychologist would say. Never say you are X. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. like it's really positive and you're sure they really are. You can say the behavior. You are, be I mean, it would have been weird, but she could have said he's behaving lethargically, but as opposed to describing him as lethargic, either to you or him, we know that the impact of character behavior language is deep because mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. You are this. I see you as this, as opposed to, and even then, it sounds to me like, based on your experience, he's not lethargic, <laughs> and so it was an inaccurate perception. Yeah, far from it. So one thing that I just want to—you raised a point earlier that I think is super, super important, which is, does this work we're doing at Search Institute um, uh, risk being good stuff that people kind of say, yeah, that's good stuff, but it seems uh, like it's not um, really about. Uh, paradigm change or system change. It's fluffy. Mm -hmm. and there's that risk. The one thing that I, the reason that I'm pretty passionate about it though, is that I think if we can get this work advanced enough, both in terms of the science, but equally in terms of the practice, meaning sharp enough, clear enough, um, the lens of relationships 
could be a very powerful, accessible way to move the furniture on some of these things that we all know are um, getting in our way, undermining kids' success, because it seems like something I can control and I'm responsible for. So that teacher's mm -hmm. relationship with you at that moment, mm -hmm. it's something that was deeply damaged by that comment. Because if we say to her, your problem is bias, your problem is, it is bias. Mm -hmm. But if we said you need to build a developmental relationship with Chris as a parent, and then more to the point with those kids, can we use the lens of relationship, development relationship, to get at some of these, um, these things we've all been talking about for the last couple of decades and trying to move the needle on, but in a way that seems very accessible and doable, but doesn't fudge the tough stuff. You know, doesn't make it like um, happy sing song, we're gonna love all the kids, but is saying, what do you need internally as an educator, for instance, to do with your perceptions to build this kind of relationship with mm -hmm. the kids. Um, Cause I think most of the people we've worked with, when we say, if you have those kind of biases in your head, you can't build this relationship. They actually see that, but you don't start there. First you start, the kids need these relationships. They, they're the roots of youth development. When kids have these relationships that are developmental in their lives, they put down those roots, they can withstand the storms that life throws at them. But the roots, are deeply shaped by the soil around them and in the mm -hmm. air. And if there's toxins or if it's just fallow, if it's like back to that story at the beginning of our time, neutral, mm -hmm. uh, the roots aren't going to go deep. They aren't going to multiply. You know, um, people who study critical race theory and um, read a lot of Derek Bell, um, there's a very damning conclusion to his scholarship, which is just basically that racism is permanent, endemic, and inbred in the, into the soil and the air of the United States in, in America and the way that we operate. And the best of people breathe the same air. You know, the best of people with the best of intentions are raised in the same country and they breathe the same air. Um, and they probably carry with them into the classroom a lot of the breathing that they have done. And, and you said something way earlier about putting um, – some safeguards around taking that one study that we talked about with the positive feedback too too seriously like that you know let's it's good it's promising information but don't take it and run with but what i thought was so interesting about that a while ago and i don't know if you have a thought about this is we never practice that much care with research that is telling us bad things about our kids mm -hmm. right so when it comes to things like the 30 million word deficit, supposedly, that is supposed to exist between black and white children or low income and high income children, we would never even question that for 30 years. We would just suck that down and keep repeating it over and over and over again without anybody ever stopping and saying that was done with all white middle class researchers who were talking to just 25 women on welfare who obviously would have acted differently than the middle-class white parents they did because of who they were talking to, exactly. right? But I believe that scientific racism causes us to actually suck down all of the deficit um, stuff without even really thinking about it and question all of the positive stuff, right? And I think that's a science problem. I don't know how you get over it. You're a scientist in ways. I mean, you're, you're dealing with evidence and evidence bases. I don't know how you get over it, but I know your positive work that you do has to overcome a great body of work that tells you that poverty correlates with bad performance, that, you know, um, family structure, as I talked about yesterday with the guest, is the thing that drives the differences. It, it would be hard to get to your message of, no, there are things you can do actually that that help children achieve. Now, I don't know if I oversold it. Like on Twitter, I said, I found the secret <laughs> uh, to improving the lives of millions of children. And Dr. Kent Pakal is going to come on my show today and tell me about it. Um, but I do feel like there's really something here. Do you have an idea or a thought about it overcoming the large body of work, though, that really, really forms a negative wall um, uh, of deficits around our kids? Um, that's a great point. I totally take your point about qualifying the positive. I, I hope had I talked about a negative, like the, um, the 30,000 word study, which has been significantly de debunked, I would have been just as qualified because that's a little bit what I get paid to do. But I, I really am like in the midst of this space between research policy and practice. So I try not to qualify everything because that just 
I hate that when people just say, well, the answer is yes, but, or maybe. <laughs> it's, it's complicated. <laughs> Here's the thing I think I would say. Um, there's actually a quote from that I, we use in workshops and stuff from the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard, which is really a, a, not just at Harvard, it's a collaborative for of the best researchers in the country. And there's sort of a kicker quote that we use in these workshops that um, in it, the one strongest finding across all fields of study regarding young people, whether it's developmental psychology or, um, uh, I mean, education, youth development broadly, is that kids who overcome sometimes dramatic, sometimes not dramatic, adverse life experiences and go on to thrive have had developmental relationships with adults in their lives. Mm -hmm. Single most powerful finding. And it runs across every discipline, it runs across every culture. And so when we talk about, um, let's not qualify the good news too much. I think your point is really well taken. Let's not undersell the power of those developmental relationships in, in kids' lives. So maybe your, your tweet was not, uh, I'm glad you tweeted it, even though like some people could say yes, but, yes, but, yes, but. But mm -hmm. connections, um, these developmental relationships uh, with kids really are the single best thing we can do. But then I always rush to say, as we were saying a minute ago, they're not the only thing we need to do. Mm -hmm. the quality of the curriculum, the, the skill of the instruction, all of that stuff still matters. But we've got to elevate relationships to the point where it's part of that, you know, really critical box. And then we approach it rigorously. And we approach yeah. It. It's kind of like saying that, you know, the human body, oxygen isn't the only thing that the human body needs. Um, you'll die without it. Right. But even after you have air, you're going to need water and food and some other things. You yeah. know, it's, yeah. it's it's saying two things at once, something super critical to your life, but not sufficient to, for all your life. Right. Um, um, which I think is really important. I actually believe that it's one of our, um, our big problems that we do have to overcome this thing around the negative science actually overtaking the positive. I like to talk on this show about the achievement gospel. I've been saying that for a while now, um, which is the good news about achievement. What are the good news that we have about our kids, the things that are positive ways we can look at them that help us move forward that are based on evidence though, yeah. not just happy talk, not happy talk. Bring me some science that tells me kids do better if you do A. And, and we've been talking a lot today about teachers, classrooms, but there are implications outside of teachers and, and classrooms, right? This is also for adults all the way around, right? right. This has implications for everybody. Um, wh what do you think about a child that is in a society or in a community that doesn't have all the other um, adults firing on all cylinders? You know, one of the reasons that I also went to Search Institute is I really, for like the first 20 years of my career, I really was a schools person. I really was like, it's all in the school. Yeah. K-12 in particular, although I did stuff on college readiness. And um, when I got eight years ago to this nonprofit, I discovered the power of out-of-school time and community. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. long history in that space. Unlike what we're trying to do, frankly, it was not in historically marginalized communities. Um, for you here in um, Minnesota, Chris, you would know we were more St. Louis Park than we were North Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. We're trying, we're, we now have 75% of our projects are all with historically marginalized uh, kids growing up in historically marginalized communities, either the organizations or the communities. I have become such a, an enthusiastic believer in the power of youth serving organizations beyond schools to provide kids with those developmental relationships in a way that often is very time limited. It frankly mm -hmm. is efficient because they can really focus on it. And we've known about this stuff forever. You know, every, every educator can talk about the power of athletics or performing arts in the lives of the handful of kids in that school who really invest in it. Um, and what I've started to see is there's this whole sector, there's this ecology outside schools of organizations, too often underfunded, you know, under uh, resourced in other ways, but full of people who are passionate about these relational connections with kids. And, um, the potential of actually being dramatically more systematic and how we connect kids to those opportunities um, is, I think, untapped. And that's mm -hmm. a thing mm -hmm. like that we do. It's not been operationalized. I remember there was one point where I was in St. Paul Public Schools and I was an administrator, and we had a very hard-charging principal over at Johnson High School on the east side, uh, mm. 
poverty area. I don't like to characterize that, but for your viewers, so you have mm-hmm. something who's not an affluent suburban school. And and I was just saying to her, her name's Kay Arndt. I said, Kay, we we should. Are your kids being served by out of school time? Uh, do you know that? And of uh, various organizations, she said, No, we don't really know. So we literally had a meeting of all of the uh, organizations they could find that were serving that school. And then we did one a variation of the kind of classic dot exercise that kids teachers sometimes do, where they put all the names of the kids on the wall and they put a dot by someone that you think you know, and then you look and you say, um, Oh my gosh, there's these kids that have no dots. It's mm-hmm. actually well. Uh, exercise to do what we did with the staff of that school and, and the, the out of school time providers, the, the community providers was we listed, we, we put dots by all the kids they're serving. And it was the same 60 kids being served by multiple organizations. Wow. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. It was a systemic effort to try and connect the kids to these opportunities. The kids who are like relationship magnets were trying many of them, who really needed and deserved additional support, but there was no coherent strategy in the school to say, how do we bring additional supports in to from the community to benefit kids? And we were talking a minute ago about the nonprofit communities and schools. That's one reason I love their work so much, because and there's lots of ways to do that. So that's one thing CIS does in a school is for the usually the, the highest need kids, but also sometimes for all kids, depending on the size of the school, they broker those community resources in a way that we might wish um, school counselors and social workers and educators can do, but which sometimes they just don't have the bandwidth to do because they get pulled into discipline and, and other things. Um, so that's kind of a long winded way to answer your question that yes, when we're talking about developmental relationships, the, the, the really exciting thing is that um, this can be a through line across all the stuff that we want to be in and could be doing for kids. Um, you know, I've been a part of efforts to bring out of school time programs in to help kids learn math. And that can be the thing to do. But the reality is, probably the people who are working with that program don't really know math. And even if they know math, they don't know your curriculum. And so it's a good thing to try and do, but it's really hard. But if the common denominator across those things we're trying to do, very much including families, uh, is building developmental relationships with kids, and we have a common framework for those relationships. We define it as expressing care, challenging growth, providing support, sharing power, and expanding possibility. We can actually get data and look at how our kids are experiencing those things, and we can work together to broaden the relationships in their lives. I think that's the most important thing, the relationships. If you've heard anything else on this broadcast today, it's been about relationships are key. I don't think that my tweet was quick uh, clickbait when I said that we have found the secret of how to improve the lives of millions of children. I think we have delivered. I also believe that it's going to require people who are deeply interested in what you have heard just now to dig in a little bit. You, you probably have to go take a look at the framework and give it its due diligence in terms of your attention to to studying it, really thinking it through, because this isn't an easy concept, I think, for everybody to grasp. It's one thing to just say relationships matter. It's another thing to know how they matter in science um, and with a lens on improvement, you know, improvement for children's lives. Kent, I thank you so much for coming on this morning. Um, I have been flashing your um, Twitter handle across the bottom of the thing there, but is there any other way that people should uh, reach you? And is there anything else that you would point them to that you want them to take a look at? So my email address is on the Search Institute website. I am uh, terrible at Twitter, but this is a further prompt to get better at it. Uh, (laughs) So I will try and do that. I'm just gonna say this, and this is a, a, you know, part of the thing that everyone out there watching should remember. Uh, Research is critical, but research is often a lagging indicator because if it's good, it takes forever. Um, And so we are on the cusp in August of releasing the first wave of the tools that have emerged from our research for really bringing that framework to life. We are in the midst of synthesizing those findings, and some of them are about professional development, some of them are about our direct tools for interacting with kids, and some of them are, are about measurement, and then some of them are about families and family engagement. And so all four of those food groups we will have new content available and depending on funding, we hope to make it as freely and widely available as we can starting in the fall when, though it seems distant now, all of our schools and all of our out of school time programs will reopen mm-hmm. and we'll all face this challenge of reentry. And if we can remember reentry has to happen first through relationships, 
Um, I think that this moment we're on the cusp of or a few months away um, will go a lot better than if we just talk about social distancing and, oh, my God, we got to get back to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Kent. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. This has been great.